Volume 2, The Interlude with Drew. What's good, everybody? How's everybody doing? I hope everybody's good. Welcome to another episode of The Interlude with Drew. Today, I have a very special guest, the maestro on keys uh, with a heart of gold, <laughs> Samuel Simon. My bro, how you doing, man? Man, I'm good, man. Man, I'm doing well, man. I'm honored, man. I'm so, so honored to be one of the ones that you decided to even consider to be a part of this, man. It's it's huge, man. It's huge for me, for real. I appreciate this. Man, for I'm sure, bro. Me. It's definitely an honor to have you on here, man. I'm so glad you were able to do it. I know you're super busy. You got a whole lot going on. I actually caught you guys when you were on the tour stop in New York. And it's definitely wow. incredible to see like all, all that God is doing through you, man. So I'm so happy that you're able to do this interview. That's love, man. That's love. I remember New York. Was it Barclays? Yes, sir. Barclays. Barclays. Yeah, Barclays. That was the first. Actually, that was the first stop of the uh, second leg, actually. I think. Right, right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yes, sir. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Yes, sir. So let, let's start at the beginning. How did you get your start in music? Man, I man, I'm gonna be. I don't have like a like a, a crazy story, you know. Man, I I'm a late bloomer, man. I was all things football. Okay. Like, okay. Yeah, I was. I was man. I wanted to go pro. Like that was my thing, man. All the way up until I got into a surgery, I had got hurt, you know, doing practice, and um, someone fell on my ankle, and oh, it broke. Man two different places and I had to it resulted into me having to have two surgeries and during those surgeries I wouldn't I wasn't able to go to school and what happened was man um I ended up you know my parents man they ended up having like a spare Casio and oh. then while I was out on bed rest and I was done with all my schoolwork um, because I wasn't able to attend um, school traditionally in person. So I was doing it virtually, you know, completing all my assignments. And when I was done, I was so bored, man. <laughs> and uh, I'll be honest, I didn't have nothing else to do but mess around on that Casio. Okay. And yeah, it was through that, man. I was messing around on that Casio, man. And through that Casio, I learned how to play like Mary Had a Little Lamb. Gotcha. I just I was just super bored, but man, I continued. You know, that's where it started for me, man. I continued to um just keep going, man. And I don't know, man. I think during that moment, man, I was just like, man, if this, like, even audibly, like, if this makes sense, um, you know, I was just trying to put the pieces together. Like, if this note makes sense here, I was making um almost like auditory guesses musically, then this makes sense here. You know what I mean? Okay. And I would put them together and try different things out. And I'm not going to lie. I think that's where it brewed from, just being curious, you know, from the times that I was on a cast and just laying down, just being bored, man, just, just literally just learning through that. And then through YouTube, you know, you got switches through YouTube. And I just learned and continued to go, man. And I just never looked back. You know what I mean? So that's where it started for me, you know? Wow, that's incredible. So you, so this is like late high school, right? Yeah, I was like a sophomore, man. Like, okay. I want to say like 16, 17, man. Just, wow. you know, just a sophomore. I had to spend at least two months out of school, man. I could really? Not, wow. Yeah, two months out of school and man I was just you know the teachers were sending me stuff you know to and back but I mean I was always you know just super on it academically but bored I was always bored and my parents had that spare Casio man I turned that thing on and mm -hmm. you know they had those little uh those little sample like um so had the yeah those song yeah. joints I was just seeing the outwork because it would um, even visually, it would expose and um, give like a visual like teaching because it would have the diagram of the piano on the screen. You know right, what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Yes, sir. Just learning it like that, man, and, and just 
and like it started to make sense. I was like, oh, I get this. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm gonna be honest, I did that not knowing where it would lead me. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the treasure is, man. A lot of times we start things and we just start them out of curiosity, but we just don't know where they'll lead us. You know what I mean? So I was just like, man, just I just was bored at the time. And that's just how far my mind could even expand, like in regards to music. You get what I'm saying? I was just yes, super bored, just learning, just wanting to understand like what I was doing, not knowing that there was another side to it years later. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's just what it was, you know? Wow, that's really incredible. It's, it's funny because most of us keyboard players, we all have like humble beginners with the Casio. But yeah. usually for most people I know of, like I, for me, I, I had my Casio and I was like six or seven. But for yeah. you to like, because of being out um, and at home and out of boredom, picking it up. And in, in a way, like the Casio kind of taught you because you're looking at everything on screen. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's really amazing. Yeah, just making sense of anything, you know. But that's how it started for me. You right. know, that's just the way that I picked it up. And mind you, I mean, to me, it's considered considered late when you're starting at like 16, 17. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. That's just what it was, you know what I mean? But right. that's how it was. Yeah, know? and, and I, I know I know um you know you recently had a birthday. Happy birthday again. But I appreciate you, man. For yes, real. sir. But I, I didn't realize that you were only 26, bro. Yeah. Wow. Kid, <laughs> so, connecting that to the story, that's only about like 10 years ago then. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I think. I think a lot of people like ask, like, man, how did you know? How did it get expedited so fast? Yeah, with yeah that's what I was gonna say. Like, how did it grow? I'm gonna be real, man. Like, it really didn't kick in until, like, so from there, you know, I learned and I just kept going, man. And I had some time. I'm not gonna lie, I was learning, you know. And by the time I was in college. You know, I was decent enough for my father to ask me, hey, can you, you know, can you please, like, help us out at the church? And okay. I did it, you know, and that turned into a normalcy there. You know, usually when they ask you one time, they're really asking you forever. You get what I'm saying? So, oh, yeah. So I just did it. And, like, but I still didn't. I just picked it up as a hobby, man. I didn't take it personally. Like, I still felt like I had a future for football. And that's the thing, man. Like, I was super, like, I was just super into it uh, sports-wise and athletically. Like, I didn't think anything of this, man. I just picked it up as, like, a side, almost, like, hidden talent. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Maybe – that's how I, that's, that's how I like saw it in my mind. That's my narrative for it. As far as perspectively in my mind, it's just something that I just saw, you know, just, just put it, you know, no one can ever know, just don't take it seriously, but your main thing will be academics and sports. You know what I mean? Right. So um, I went to, I did not go anywhere. For by the time I was a senior, I did not go anywhere for sports, man. And I just didn't want to, man. I was like, man, let me just focus on academics. Even though I had a couple D2 offers, I was like, man, I'm straight. I'll just continue just doing academics, you know, you know, at that point. And man, I'm gonna be honest, I was super interested into being an orthopedic surgeon because oh, okay. I was yeah, I was super inspired. And I by that time, like usually when you I had those surgeries, I was almost like self-diagnosing myself, man, doing oh, research. Really? Yeah, man. I was just, you know, understanding the, the concepts of the bone, you know, through that. Again, this is outside of music. I was just super curious, you know what I'm saying? So I decided to go to, I decided to go to college. But when I went to college, I didn't study anything in orthopedics. I decided to help because I realized how much of a depressive state that it had towards me. Um, 
it, it had such a big depressive state not being able to move so i was like man what would it be like to be a social worker like a medical social worker right, right. so i decided to go to school in lakeland florida at this school for uh called southeastern university and i was like man what would it be like to be a a medical social worker to help those who were in my position you know because i could understand how much of a how much of a depressive state that it could be so i went to school in um uh southeastern in lakeland and when i went to school i started off doing social work you get what i'm right. saying yeah. So when I started off doing the social work, man, I was just grinding in that. But at the same time, like the music scene over at the school was a lot more appealing and a lot more, it was just more attractive. It, it, I mean, it wasn't anything like insane. Like it wasn't like an LA scene, that, but it was just a lot bigger than what I was usually like accustomed to back home in Fort Myers. So I decided to do the whole thing. And, um, you know, I decided to continue on. Um, I was picked, I was joining bands in college, you know, I was working at a church called Free Life Chapel, you know, working there as far as, you know, playing over there. I just, you know, just that's when it started to kick in for me. I was taking jazz courses as I was, you know, studying social work, I was taking okay. it like um, contemporary band. And through that, there is a progression, like, because I started to take it a lot more seriously. It is, it, you know, it figurated something in me to continue to practice. And man, I was practicing and practicing and practicing and practicing okay. and staying connected. And then there was a weird turn, man. Like I started making friend groups out of music you know i started linking up with people out of music and then i thought to myself i was like man what is going on so the trajectory of my life began to change my friend groups you know i had this dualism where i had a good amount of friends for social work and i had a good amount of friends for music you know what i mean yeah and the school that I had had like a whole worship team, SCU worship, and you know I applied for the team, you know, just wanting to be a part, you know, and I didn't make it the first time, but I made it the second time, you know what I mean, and, and even more so, like even though I was still like to myself and just super like quiet, you know, as far as like socially. But with my friends, you know, like the homies that we that shared similar musical interests at that school, I was always vibrant more. Um, I was more external with it, a lot more, uh, just a lot more present musically. You get right. what I'm saying? Yeah. And man, I just we just kept practicing, man. I was I was in the gospel choir. Like it just grew from in college, man. My first year, I was super shy. You know, my first semester, I was super shy. Second semester, I met some homies. You know what I mean? Then my sophomore year of college, like that's when I was like, oh snap! Like, like I'm gonna continue putting um, social work, you know, here, but at the same time. I feel like music is much more of a priority now. Right, right. That's what yeah. decided to change for me on my sophomore year of college. And um, like my first semester, man, I was I was in it, man. I was doing a lot of like I was learning Ableton, like okay. That's when it really started. I learned like Omnisphere. Like I had some great friends, man, that taught me Omnisphere and how to use Ableton and all of that. And then through the second semester, that's when I decided to change to being, um, I decided to change from being traditional to online because I got picked up from Travis. You oh, know? okay, during college. Yeah, during okay. college, you know? And because I had to continue school, social work did not have a program, an online program. So I had to change majors in order to make both work. 
So I went from, from social work to starting over in organizational leadership. Got you. And Got you. That's, how I, that's how I made both work. You know what I mean? So that's it, man. And through Travis, like, I just kept going, man. And, mm -hmm. and at that point, like, it was music from there, you know? Yes, sir. You know, so, so the, yeah. All right. No, I was saying, like, so the shift really happened in college. That's in when college. I started taking it serious. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting because it's like you went there, like, just having a, a, you know, basic start in music, but having no real desire to really make it like a life thing. And all yeah. of a sudden, it's a shift midway through. Man, it was crazy, man. Even, even through social work, like, I was studying social work, man, I went through this weird like phase as far as what I wanted to be, man. Like through social work, I started off wanting to do like the medical social work thing. And then I just developed a heart for the prisoners. And all of a sudden want to be a probation officer. You know, okay. it was it was crazy, man. And I started working at the probation's office. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just started shadowing probation officers. And then you know, and this is this is the premise. I think the thing is that because you know, music to me wasn't like a solid thing, and I didn't have a lot of faith in how solid music could have been yeah. for me. Like I wanted to be safe and find an avenue that can at least like help me pay my bills. Right. If all if music fails, right, then yeah. I have support. You know what I mean? Yep. If music doesn't do what I needed to do financially, then social work will because I have benefits. Exactly. Because I have, you know, a salary and I have all of this kind of stuff. Not realizing and I had that perspective in my mind in college, which to some people they would understand and agree that you're supposed to have like some sort of safety net in case, you know, because, you know, the music industry is a, you know, what it offers, that's a whole different entity, you know, yeah. a, a whole different conversation. But the truth of the matter is I did and have all that perspective without realizing like purpose. Right. Like, your purpose, like mm -hmm. your purpose is not like, like, it's not social work. Let's just be honest, Sam. And I had to have that hard conversation when I would hear that from God, you know, because I did realize that every time I was running away from music, I was always getting clothes hanged back into music. Mm -hmm. It's weird, you know? Every time that I was running away from all things music, I was always being pulled back into it. And I'm like, man, why am I always being pulled back into it as if like it's supposed to be a full time thing right. for me? Mm -hmm. That's when the Lord reminded me and was just like, man, this is not a thing of safety for you. This is what I'm calling you to. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. This yeah. is what I'm calling you to. And it's better for you to trust in what I'm calling you to than for you to feel safe outwardly outside of my purpose for you outside of my will it's a lot better for you to understand that this is like i'm i knew and i've orchestrated your life like this before you were born right. and because i orchestrated your life like this before you were born i'm i'm only like exemplifying and demonstrating and projecting onto you what I know about you and what I'm calling about you and calling for you and calling you too. You know what I mean? So I think, I think at that point, like I hit a breakthrough, man. I hit a, I hit a point in a, in a lid and I was just, I had to be honest in college. I had to be honest, like, man, is this a calling, you know, is this a calling that I'm feeling because I don't want to do music because it doesn't feel safe financially. And I keep hearing all these different horror stories, you know, about yeah. all this different stuff in regards to music. But the truth of the matter is, it's not about that, man. And I had to get to the point where if I wanted to live a life that was submitted to God, 
If I wanted to live a life that was submitted to God, I would strip away my desires. Mm -hmm. I would strip away what I think is safe and trust in the divine safety net of the Father. Wow. And, man, it was hard because what ends up happening is it challenges your perspective of God. For sure. And anything that challenges your perspective of God, if it can change and get to and nudge your perspective of God, then it's not of God. And at that point, do you really believe? Wow. You know? Yeah. Do you really believe? So I had, man, I know, I know you asked for this, but like, and that's this no, is no, just no, I love my it. I love honesty it. and my vulnerability, but I had to get to a lot of different. Man, I had to get to a lot of different, um, like, real conversations and just, like, a lot of moments where I had to question, man, where's my life headed, mm -hmm. you know? And out of that question came the filter of, God, is this what you want for me, you know? Like, yeah. what does that actually mean? Like, I had to really ask myself what it actually meant, you know? So that's... That's, that's, you know, the physical part, you know, the, the natural part of my journey, yeah. but also the supernatural part where I had to ask myself, like, you know, like, what's for real my purpose, what's, what's legitimately my purpose, you know what I mean? And, man, and the truth of the matter is, man, I got to this point, you know, I got to this point in my life where I was just like, man, if... As long as I'm following the purpose and the will of God for my life, I will always be taken care of. Yes, God sir. is not a person. He's not a person that works backwards. Mm. He's not a person that just, he don't have a track record of dropping people. No, you, don't got a, you know what I'm saying? He don't got that. He doesn't have a track record of, of dropping people and letting people, you know, down. And like, when you look in his word, he never does that, one. And secondly, he won't start that with you, you know? So this was all challenging my perspective of God right. and how he sees me as his son, you know? I know you ain't asked for all that. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm so glad you shared yeah. that. It's just real stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm just being honest. You get what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Man, that's powerful. One, one scripture that comes to mind while I'm hearing you share is um, in Proverbs, it says it like twice. And I try to live by this. He said, we make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. And that yes. is, 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 is crazy seeing like how that played out in your life because you had a way that you saw your life going and what you wanted to see for yourself. But God had a, a different purpose and it took you yielding to his purpose and then look look at the results now. So that I know, I know that's that's definitely going to be encouraging for the listeners to know that you know what, just trust God, even if it doesn't make sense in the moment, because He's He's you know the author and the finisher of your faith. He knows everything about your life and why He created you. Exactly, man. And 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 in addition to it, I think what's the hard part is like realizing the package that it comes with. It comes with confusion. Oh, yeah. It comes with doubt. It comes. I think that's really because that stuff speaks to us a lot more, even naturally, man. That stuff has a a lot more access to the ear gates of our hearts a lot more than anything. Like the doubt, you know, and mm -hmm. and just man, the truth of the matter is you're just gonna have to overcome that. You really are, and you're gonna have to deal with it, you know. But I guess the hill of God comes where you realize that it's not hell, it's heaven. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is that he knows where you're going next. Oh, yes. He does. And that's where the hope lies. And you can just anchor your soul on that. Like, he just knows where you're going next, man. So just lie in that truth. And you just never know, man. And that's the beauty, man. Like, you don't know you really have no clue like where he he'll actually take you. Yes, sir. And just that in itself is just, you know, that's a healing bomb because he does have plans for all of us, bro. All of us. He doesn't he doesn't create us and just wants us to die like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he, he really does have plans for all of us. 
you know, and and if you just if you just stay faithful, man, and you grind it out and you continue to learn and you practice and you develop and you stay developed, you know, I think that's it, man. Just keep learning. You grow, you grow, you grow. At some point, you learn past your environment. You, right, you, you learn past your your surroundings and the yoke begins to break because you done grew your gift to be this big. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah. In addition to you growing your gift to be that big, you also grew your heart to be that big. And God says, man, I need that heart for the world. Oh, you yeah. think he's not going to put you out? You get what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. that's the beauty of it, man. There's a there's a way for it, man. It happens. It does happen, you know? So that's an encouragement for all the listeners out there, man. Just, just stay the course, you know, trust in what God is calling you to. And the, and the sad truth is that it may not be music. You get what I'm saying? It may not be too, you know? But I think this is more purpose-oriented than anything. Absolutely. You get what I'm saying? So that's the truth, bro. Yes, sir. I love that, man. It, it, it is a harsh reality for a lot of us that what we think it may be just because we enjoy music or we enjoy a certain thing, we just assume that that's what God has for us. But God, he has an ultimate plan and it takes us getting closer to him and hearing his voice and ultimately seeing what it is that he has for our lives. So I love I love what you shared, man. That's definitely, definitely encouraging. Yeah, that's facts, bro. That's facts. That's how it is. That's yes, just how it is. Yes, sir. So you said in college, like the reason why you had to switch from um, being in person to virtual was because you got picked up by uh, Travis Green. Um, what Around what year was that? And then how, how did that initially happen? That was 2000 and I want to say 2000 and like 17. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That was 2017. So I'll be real, man. I um while I was in high school, I picked up keys while I was in 10th grade. Like I kept progressing and you know, junior year I was grinding and all the way up until sophomore uh senior year, you know, I was grinding and I wasn't like I was never like, you know, known or anything like that especially where I come from in my city, but I was always like trying to connect with the people that were the, at, at the place where I wanted to be, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. One of those people is a man named Brunus Charles. Now, Brunus, he is from Naples, where that's about, you know, 30, 45 from where I'm from, an hour from where I'm from. Um, but we all linked up at a church called Mount Hermon and Mount Hermon was like, that was like the, the potter's house of Fort Myers, man. Gotcha. That's where, that's where, you know, the example, like that was like the exemplary church, you know what I mean? And Brunus was over there, but um, the person that was over the music was Roosevelt Stewart, right? Okay. Roosevelt Stewart was, like I knew Roosevelt before all of that. You get what I'm saying? Um, yeah. And he was like, you know, we grew up together. Like he, he is literally like my older brother. He's not blood, but he's literally, it literally feels like he is blood. And gotcha. Roosevelt, you know, he, man, I was in like 11th grade and he took me in. And 12th grade, I was already at the church playing. Oh, wow. this was there. You know what I mean? I was like, I went through some intense like ear training with Roosevelt and I really learned what it meant to like almost be like a church musician. You know what I mean? Like yeah. to learn a song, professionalism. Mm-hmm. I learned that. I learned a lot of that. Like to hear the different parts of a song. Like he really, really dug into my ear and gave me the awareness that I needed 
as far as a musician, like a lot of that came from Roosevelt and th from Roosevelt, he had this hub of guys that just wanted to grow from him. And through that hub of guys was Brutus and Brutus was always the top of the chain. He was gotcha. the person, you know, that understood it a lot faster than we did. You get what I mean? And he was always a lot more just attentive and like, and, and Roosevelt trusted Brutus to lead us. He, he trusted Brutus to, he trusted Brutus that, um, to lead us. And he was more of like an MD while Roosevelt was handling the choir. He was handling youth. He was handling so many different parts. And, and Roosevelt would divide the music role between him and Brutus. Gotcha. And Brutus was always an incredible leader, man. Like, he grinded. We all grinded together. We did certain things outside of the church together, like taking trips up to South Carolina, you know, and hearing people like Devon Goodwin yeah. and Chad Moore mm -hmm. at uh, these different recordings. And what ended up happening was through that, I believe the hunger, the hunger to grow just stemmed from that season, man. And that's a real significant thing, you know, for me, like I was just always hungry, wanted to learn, wanting to learn, wanting to be developed. Like I was just like, no matter what, like I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna learn this song. I don't care how tired we are. Like Brutus and Roosevelt, especially Roosevelt, he instilled in us this, this drive. He instilled in us this work ethic to legitimately stay long hours to to accomplish what it meant to be one band, one sound. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, he yeah. Did, he, he's the one that like, like drilled us, man. And we weren't tired. We were just in there grinding, man. We were just in there trying to understand these parts and what it means to play parts and what it means to play these chords and hearing the types of chords and, and hearing, and even backing up a preacher on an organ, like he taught me what that meant. Like even like how to organ fundamentals and all of that, you know? And I did my personal, like um, I did my personal discovery outside of, of Roosevelt and Brunus. Like yeah. I would go home and try to beat what they taught me okay. and apply what they taught me in addition to what I'm teaching myself at home and applying that on Sunday just because I wanted to reach for the stars right. you know I wanted to reach for um I wanted to reach for the best I wanted to reach new heights and new levels I wanted to understand what that meant you know what I mean so and um Rose there was a moment where Brunus um he moved to LA and when he moved to LA, you know, I guess he met up with Travis. And this is all while I'm in college. Was it while I'm in college? Like senior year transitioning into, I believe it was senior year transitioning into my first year of college. Like, you know, like we're all getting text messages that Brunus is with Travis. Okay. And we're not wanting to be with Travis. Like we're just... Like the fact that someone from the city was connected with someone main at a mainstream artist like that, you know, at that caliber, that was enough for us, man. That was that was like a, a big W for us. And we're like, man, we're so happy for him. And the reason why we were so happy for him was because we knew that he would take his experiences with Travis or his experiences with the people that he was working for. I'm I believe he was working with Dr. Phil. Like, oh, wow. you know what I mean? When he was working with Dr. Phil, he was, you know, working with different artists like Major. Like, while he was working with all these different artists, what he would do is he would take those experiences, you know, and he would take those experiences, those work experiences as a musician, and he would pour them back into us, right? Yeah. And I felt like that was really significant for us because he didn't hoard all of his experiences and acted like he was the only 
key. You know, he had the key. You know, he would unlock these truths. He would unlock these and receive these truths as far as professionalism, as far as details, my production management, music directing. He would take all these experiences and he would pour them back into us. And we're like, man, we can't wait to apply those truths on a Sunday morning. Right, right, right. You know? And man, it felt like a live recording every Sunday morning at Mount Hermon. Yeah. For yeah. real. Yeah. And it's not like, again, we weren't trying to get on. We weren't trying to be mainstream. We wanted to be developed. We right. were hungry into being developed, you know? And while, you know, I was in college, you know, Brutus was, he was doing, he was definitely doing Travis. And we were staying up with our friendships. And then all of a sudden, Brutus brought Roosevelt on with Travis, you know? And when he brought Roosevelt on with Travis, Roosevelt was like, man, I love playing, man. But I also feel this pastoral thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I was super close with those guys, man. And they took me in. For real, they really took me in as their little brother. For real. And I was always improving trying to understand sounds and i was on this journey of understanding ableton and i was teaching them you know different things and they were applying it you know and they were applying it with travis and applying it at you know where they were you know what i mean and what ended up happening was you know brunus saw me and he was just like bro come play this date with us you know i don't have anybody you know, and he felt like I was worthy because I was also being developed and learning and and applying these sounds and and just understanding. I had this this cool little discovery season of soundscapes and um, Ableton and even showing the guys, you know, even showing Brutus, one of the guys with Travis, how to latch on Omnisphere. He was like, bro, just come and, and do, do this date with us. January 2nd, it was passion. It was like about 7,000 people in there in wow. Arlington, Texas. And then he asked me to do that date. And man, the night before or the week before, man, I was I was like, I, had, I went into this mode. I was sending him like, yo, this is how I'm gonna play this song. Like, how do you feel about this? You know, and at that point, I had an idea of what it meant to play parts, you know, and he asked me, I remember him asking me about like Ryder, like, what do I want? And I remember asking him what that was like, <laughs> you need to tell me I can have what I meant. I mean, I could have what I want. He was like, yeah, like, just tell us what you want. You know what I mean? As far as what you need, like your specs, like, like even your laptop stands, like all of that, you know, I remember all of those different things. And man, I'm in a dorm room in college. You get what I'm saying? And yeah. And and I'm I'm about to leave and do this thing. And sure enough, man, like it came time to it. I did it, you know, and when I did it, you know, I met everyone. I met JR. I met Josh Easley. Mm -hmm. I met um I met uh, Taiwan Mac, who was doing front of house, you know. Um, I met Taylor Poole, and sure enough, was Travis, and I did it, man. And when I did it, like, he was just so, so kind, man. He was so, so kind. Like, it was just a cool little vibe. I think um, one of the things that marked me was that, like, you know, um, I had to get my jitters out the first night, man. Like I was going into it with a head full of insecurity, like dog, like these guys, they got years. Josh has years, mm -hmm. you know, JR has years, Brunus has years. And I'm the only rookie in the camp, man. And I was so, so I remember the headspace that I was in, but I was like, man, everything that you need to be successful tonight is already inside of you. Wow. It yeah. is. You know, everything that you need in order to succeed, in order to have a great show, you can already do it. You know, if, you know, like, 
and that's the truth of it. Like everything you need, it's already in you, man. You can do this stuff. So that encouraged me. Like this is right before the show, you know, and that encouraged me to continue um, to believe in myself. You know what I mean? Because, and it was weird because it wasn't like a standard show. Like Passion, the way they do their sound checks is they do it the night before at like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Oh, wow. So, can you, yeah, can you imagine? Yeah. Like, for me, first impression was everything. And I'm yeah. like, man, I'm going to get started. Is this what it means to be a part of the game? Like, 1 a.m. sound checks? Like, I yeah, never yeah. heard that. Like, it's a little weird, like, 2 a.m., and I had to wait. You know, you got to, there's a waiting room. You have to wait for the band before you to, like, you know what I mean, to finish. And and you're hearing how they sound, and you get, and you're like, man, what are they doing that I should be doing? That way I don't appear as a rookie. Right. I was going through all of that, man, the night before, you know? And, man, you know, I did the sound check, and then you have to study the transition, you know? And I was laptop. No, nah, was I? No, nah, I don't think I was. I was use I wasn't using so I think I was using software that night. Okay. So transitioning, yeah, transitioning with software that night looked a lot different, you know, because you got to take out their quarter inches, make sure that it's muted, and all of that kind of stuff. And I had to communicate that with them, and I was just hoping that I don't appear as a rookie, man. And, but ultimately, we did it, and man, it went great. And That's like, you know, starting starting off like that, playing keys. And with Travis, the keyboard player really starts a lot of the songs. You got to right. flow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of different, like, exposure happening. And it's a, a big sink or swim situation. Definitely. And at that moment, I had to either pull up or just drown. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I decided to to strike bro and and ever since then man it, it was all the way up from there i just they kept calling back and i got better i took every experience every gig then we did the tour the tour was like that spring like and we did the live recording you know what i mean yeah 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 record that was my first mainstream joint that i'd ever i've ever done you know and i did all of that and then Every experience, you take, you know, what you learn, and you apply it to the next experience. And even different artists, like from Travis was Rich Tober, you know, you know, because, you know, you develop friendships with your bandmates, you know, from Travis was Rich Tober. I got connected with Josh, you know, I did that whole album. I yeah. helped him out with that one. And I took my experiences with Travis and what I, what I knew with Travis, and I applied it and decided to craft a whole new sound with Rich, even though the approach had to be differently because they're two different people, yes. but still like the experiences and the truths, you can still apply them. You know what it meant to sit down and rehearse, you know, parts, you know, using main stage, even overdubbing. You get what I'm saying with that, man? You know, and from Rich Tobert was Chandler. Yeah. And after Chandler, you know, it was math. You yeah. get what I'm saying? And I was doing side stuff with, like, even now I, I do side stuff with, like, you know, I help out William McDowell's church, you know. Okay. I help okay. him out. I help out um, Todd Galbraith, even Doug Jones, like, wow. and you just take all of these different experiences, man, and you take, you just, you just apply them, and now it's just a whole different thing right now, you know what I mean? Wow, that's incredible. So, it, it, uh -huh. yeah, it's amazing to see how, like, one thing leads to another. Because I, I figured, because I know where I used to see Travis Green, I know Chandler was singing background for him. So, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and then I know you did, you did, I was going to ask you about the Broken Record uh, album. So, mm -hmm. how was that process like? Because I, I know from the previous album that Travis did, um, I believe that was the crossover to the Broken Record. There was definitely a different sound, like a, a you know a more more modern sound, I would say, 
And I, I could tell now that, you know, I, I'm familiar with your work that had a lot to do with your sound. So what was that like working on that album? Yeah. Well, that, that, that album is very endearing to me because it was my first ever like album mainstream. And mind you, I've never done album work before that. So that's why it meant a lot to me because that was like my first ever like record and your stuff makes the cut kind of thing. Man, I remember doing that album, man. That album was fun. It was fun. It was a lot of, um, we did some pre-pro. I remember sitting with Travis, man, and um, the team at his house and everyone had their own workstations. Wow. Josh had his workstation. I had my workstation. We just had different laptop setups and, and we would take the demos that he would take, that he would, uh, that he would record and do, and we would just plug them in and just, just start playing parts to them. Like, wow. yo, this works here. And we would all bounce them out and put them into the Ableton session in for rehearsal. Man, we were grinding on that. I remember having to wake up and we would drive to Charlotte and do rehearsals from 9 a.m. to like 11, just grinding on the album. And the thing is, we would do the album stuff and the tour stuff, right. meaning after the album, after we would record the album, we would do the tour. So yeah. it was all like together. You get what I'm saying? So the amount of work we had to do was insane because we would rehearse the album stuff and then rehearse the tour stuff. Mm -hmm. That was crazy to me. And that was my first experience. Like it wasn't like this very, very slow grind thing for me. It was like, yo, you're gonna get hit. And yeah. you have the opportunity to take this or if you don't wanna take it, then you're just gonna have to go home. It's either you can or you can't, you know? And I had to stick it up, you know? And I had to take it. I had to, we had to wake up, you know, um, record uh, parts and then we would rehearse, you know? But man, I think the most, one of the best things that ever happened in that album was the, was the bond, man. The bond, sure. the brotherhood there was so significant. It was so beautiful. Like we were all just trying to make it work just for the betterment of the album. You know, now um, he had Brunus produce, um, Aaron Robertson produced one song, which was Good and Loved. Okay. And I think, I can't remember correctly, but the vision for that album was more, it was more of a, a like a CCM based, you know, he had Stephanie, you yeah. know, it was more so the CCM stay based, like we were shooting more for that side, you right. know, so I had to tap out of the whole gospel thing. And I was studying Bethel, bro. I was studying Passion. Okay. I was studying Hillsong. And I would understand their voicings and why they would do certain things. And then you meet someone like Travis, you know, where where you don't want to lose, like, you don't want to lose the whole urban side or the gospel side. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to find a way to be creative into meshing the goal with who he is as an artist, right? You know what I mean? And finding out who he was as an artist was such an interesting thing, you know, because I didn't want to contaminate what was already there at the expense of giving him something new. You yep. get what I'm saying? So it was a very tricky thing for me mentally as far as vision, like what like I wanted to accomplish but man, like that album, it was incredible, man. I remember like like even I had to run tracks for that album and play mains at the same time. Like I was like the album. You get what I'm saying? Like, like even the flow moments, like having to only press click while I'm playing 
and mm-hmm. leaning over and pressing click and making sure that I'm being creative and adhering to everything, man. That was such a, it was a, a it was a very, very, very like hardworking moment for me. And um, it's just experience, man. That album was great though, man. We had Josh Easley on bass. Like um, we would rehearse at the church and him and I were figuring out what he would play for Great Jehovah. You know, would he go, go super folk or would he make it sing? You get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and JR, man, you ain't got to tell JR nothing. He just produces his own drum parts, even though he's very humble enough to want to include us in what he's producing. He's just too good. You know what I mean? Like, he's just still. You, you kind of give him the leeway into what he wants to do and whatever he did was just making the cut. You get what I'm saying? You got Brunus who was spearheading everything, all things tracks, all things like overseeing the music and all things guitars. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. You got Elijah. Man, Elijah has such a strong ear. Anything that I was playing that night for the album, he was catching. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I even remember like recording BGVs for that album. Like, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, we wow. we did BGVs on that album too. You get all of us did. Like, we were in Travis's studio room and we were just going for it. Like, mm-hmm. we would stay up, like record BGVs for this particular song. I remember for sure it was called Broken Vessels. Okay, yeah, that's all I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We went crazy on that, man. And everyone, there was no, and that's what's beautiful, man. There was no like subculture having a different attitude about the album. Yeah. We were just all in it to make it happen. You get what I'm saying? Like, you know, we were all, all in it to making it happen. We were all in it to making it work. You get what I'm saying? And when it came out, I don't, I'll never forget when it came out, man. I was like, wow. Like, I remember what it took for us to do it because there were so many moments of exhaustion only because we were rehearsing the album and the tour at the same time. Right, right. That, it hit different, you know, for, for, for a rookie like me, I was like, man, I can't believe. And it was my first thing, you know? And I also... As much, there was another side to it. Like as much as I really enjoyed doing the album, I still wanted to make sure that I wasn't appearing as a fan. I know oh. it's weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I I didn't want to make sure that I wasn't appearing as a fan, but I wanted to appear as if I was a part of yeah, yeah. the team. To be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. The reason I say that to say, like, there was a lack of promotion on my end from the album because I didn't want to appear. I just didn't know how to word yeah, the situation. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? I didn't know. I didn't. I just didn't understand at that time. I was ignorant to a lot of things when really, like, like, bro, you're supposed to be proud of your work. You're supposed to. It actually helps, you know. It actually helps the artists out when you let people know, hey, that you were super honored to be a part of this this album. But there was another part of me that was just like, man, I don't want to, I don't want to appear as an opportunist. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to appear as someone that was just just trying to grasp an opportunity from someone. But and, I, and the reason why I say that was because like. Like I had to, I had to understand what that meant to help, you know, promote the album. You know, I would help promote the album. That was on the contract. Like the musician agrees to promote the album. You know what I mean? So that was, that was another side of it. You get what I'm saying? So, and it was a very personal thing, you know, because I was watching everyone else do it and they were, they, they would ask me like, yo, why don't I know that you were on this album? Like, I should know that stuff. And I was going the more humble route and just saying, you know, it's my first time. Like, I'm just trying to make it work. And 
actually lock it in and work on being developed. And I was still going through the rookie mental syndrome. You know what I'm saying? So right. that's it, man. Yeah, but recording and doing the album was insane. Like that night we did it in a warehouse. It was in a warehouse in a in Charlotte, North Carolina, man. Chandler was there, Dante was there, Aaron Moses was there. Like we all hung out, man, and we did it. I remember getting demos for it, like, and us grinding through the music and figuring out. I think that's what it was. Like, it, like we had to figure out the vibe and the approach for each song, you know what I mean? And sounds. And I remember, I just remember all of that, man. And it was just a really cool experience. It was great, man. It was very great. I was never met that vividly. Yeah. So hearing you talk about the grind for this uh, Broken Record album, um, it sounds similar to kind of like what you have to do now. So it's like it was preparing you for what, what you're into now. Because I remember, um, I, I believe at the end of this most recent tour, you were talking about like how, uh, you know, when you guys, I, I believe Maverick City was nominated for like five Grammys. And you said the process of putting that album together was like far more difficult than anyone can imagine. Can you talk about um, like what that was like first working on the albums because Maverick City just puts them out back to back to back to back and then going on these like 50 day tours. Bro, <laughs> bro, bro, bro. Like I'm, I'm about to unpack a lot, dude. <laughs> so, so for, for like, I look back, you know, I look back and it was like 2018 and here I am 2022, you know, that was like four years ago, about four, four years ago. And that's when we recorded that album. So um, when we did that, when we did that album in 2018, the experiences of working hard, the experience, like I even remember doing the overdubs on that album on the bus oh, show wow. after show. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that only emphasizes how significant it was for me to like take in what it meant to work hard. I think I think that like in 2018 when I did Travis's album and helped him out with that, that was my first experience of the journey of completing a record, right? When I when I say the journey of it, it means like you get these songs and you have to approach it. Like personally, I like to approach every record that I'm doing as if I'm kind of like co-producing it. Yeah, so yeah. I have, like, that's just a personal thing for me. So like, I want to be creative. I want to open up and beat the artist's expectation creatively. I want to, and that's my goal. So even when I was, you know, doing that, like you talk about the journey of doing an album, what ended up happening was you take these different elements, man. You got your approach for the record, cutting the record, if you have to MD it, if you don't have to MD it. And then you got overdubs, you got to figure out the tracks, the playback, your, your mix for your sounds, your parts, you know, making sure that your EQ for your keys or your, your sounds are incredible and how much, even though it's underlooked by the natural consumer, but even more so, you still have to keep a standard sonically. You still right. have to keep a, a standard, like even within the realm of your ear gates, you have to make sure that you keep all of that as a priority, you know, even playback, click, making sure that everyone has click, making sure that like click keeps running because you have to be mindful that what you're going to overdub to needs to be to a click. You get what I'm saying? And you can't, you can't forget about that. Even making sure that even after you're done recording and it gets sold, it's going to be sent out to multi-tracks. So yeah. when people want to play that stuff at their churches, they're looking to what you do, you know? And like, I'm thinking about the journey of completing a record. And even 
pushing past your feelings to completing overdubs and your edits. Like, it's a lot, bro. It's a lot. Now, my journey from 2018 to 2022 has been night and day for sure. But the experiences can be similar. Now, this is my journey with recording the album with Mav and Kirk, right? I get a call from Mav's team. They say, hey, we're doing this recording with Kirk in Miami, right? I don't remember when we did it, man. I think I, I want to say we did it like in like April or May. I can't remember. But because of a lot of different things and a lot of different movie pieces, um, and it was at a prison, like, right. yeah. mind you, I've never heard of anything being recorded at a prison. I didn't even think that was possible. Yeah, like, me neither. Like, so you're when whenever it's prison based, you already kind of know that it's gonna be limited. Mm -hmm. Man, we, we get to I fly to Miami and they they ask me like, I think it was like a week before, but I didn't get no music until I got there. Wow. You know what I mean? All to find out that we were going to like be like creating the music with Kirk. Oh wow. Okay. So so now I've caught up with a lot of experience and all of that stuff. And I'm uh I'm not saying that I'm seasoned, but at the same time, like I'm I'm mature. I'm a, I'm a lot more mature mm -hmm. in 2022 than I was in 2017. You get yeah. what I'm saying? Yep. So, man, here we are, and we're getting the music, and we're just waiting, and then Kurt comes in, and, and it's this is in Miami, Miami, Florida, like, and, you know, people are, you know, people are coming in, and, you know, people aren't coming in as early as they were expected because of flight delays, you got, like, all this kind of stuff, and that stuff happens, man, and that's totally fine, you know, Kurt comes in with his team and they go to the back and I'm sitting here and it's just me like like HB's not there I don't I don't know like what happened but it was just me you get what I'm saying HB's yeah. not you know and this is the prison stuff you know what I mean and like while we're there like while I'm there I'm the only person because I believe this is I think this is what happened they wanted to make it a merge, right? They wanted to merge like um, Kirk's band with Mav's band, you okay. know what I mean? And possibly because of last minute changes, people couldn't commit out of what they had going. I don't know. People couldn't commit out of what they had going in order to make it. So it was just left to, to me being the only person to represent Mav with this Mav and Kirk collab. You get what I'm saying? Right. So we get there, right when I get there, I'm sitting, waiting, you know, asking for music. They're like, hey, like, you're about to get it. You know what I'm saying? And this is in Miami, Florida at Trinity Church, right? Um, we get there. Mind you, man, I was exhausted. But at that point, it's super late. You know what I'm saying? Um, then Kirk comes in. He came in with Terry Baker. Yeah. Swole. Oh, okay. So, yeah. And uh, Katron, Eric Katron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, and man, those guys were so kind, bro. They were so kind. Like, I remember, I remember coming in and, you know, I was just like, like man, like, I don't know what I'm going to be doing. All I see is a bunch of backline that I didn't even ask for. Like, you know, which is totally fine. All I see is like drums. And I assumed, I was like, oh, that's definitely Kirk's team. And I'm asking around, like, what am I going to be doing? And they're like, you're going to be playing Oregon. I'm like, all right, fine. Like, you know, and I get a Nord to Oregon. You know what I mean? And um, the Nord to Oregon didn't come with like, like a, a stand. Um, so, too busy trying to figure out how I can make the pedals work. Yeah. yeah. And, you know what I'm saying? And like the Nord pedals and putting it on a solid, a solid place. You know what I mean? Yeah. So 
Terry and Katron, they come through and they were so kind. They're like, hey man, do you need anything from us? I was like, what? You in my territory. Why are you being kind to me? You know what I mean? Man, they were cool, man. They were like, you need anything? I was like, man, I do need help figuring out like how I'm going to put this North thing together. Like, you know, I was like, I already don't like playing on it. You know what I mean? But I'll just do it just because I have to. <laughs> and they're like, it's all good. Like, so they go out, they get this big sheet, like this, like this big, huge, like, I don't know where they found it, but it was this big sheet. I put the Nord on it and it's even. And then um, the stand that they gave me was wide enough for me to put the pedals, you know, and at that time it's super late, you know, and then um then uh I think it was one of the road managers start sending me and air dropping me files of demos that they that Mav and Kirk already like had. Okay. You know what I mean? So yeah. while they're doing that, like that's when I started getting music while I was setting up my, my organ and all that kind of stuff. And I'm listening to it and I'm listening to it. And then I had, I listened to it like twice and Kirk comes in and when Kirk comes in, he puts his keyboard right in the middle because the way that the plot was set up was it was Terry outward that way, bass, by me and then keys and organ like facing each other but right. in the middle so kurt came and put his piano on the side of us it's almost like a a workstation set up for us you know right. and this is why we're on the stage you know what i'm saying so what ended up happening was we go over the songs man and man like we were grinding bro it was like like we had to go based off of memory we were coming up with parts kirk is like yo i want to i want to do this here i want to do this here i'm like yeah let's do it here he's like i want to tag this part of the song here four times and then we're going to go back into this right and then he's like man let's come up with a special i'm like sure Catron's like, sure. Everyone's like down and everyone's crying, bro. We were in it, bro. We were in it till 5 a.m. in the morning. Oh, man. And we were going over Kingdom, Bless Me. Mm -hmm. Like, we were going over all of these songs. Even for Bless Me, he was like, man, uh, you know, let's, like, what can you do here for Bless Me? And I was like, man, we could do this. Like, do -do 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 -do. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Like, you know what I'm saying? Even Katron was like, all right, that could be phase one. Phase two could be like, and then uh, Kirk was like, let's actually change this here and modify this. And then it was just this harmonious like gel and everyone was spitting out ideas. And obviously Kirk was like saying what makes the cut bro i even remember when we did kingdom there's a line in kingdom in the bridge where it's like da, 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 like that was out of that that was out of the collective harmonious moment where we were all just in the grind and we were feeling the song and i think what ended up happening was we all were, we were all married to the song and it just brought us to places that we never knew that we can go to. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there was marriage with our souls and the song, like we all loved how it felt and we started playing it as if our souls were singing it. Mm. That's where that line came from. Yeah. You, know what I mean? you know, and trying to, we tried to, I think the intentionality was that we were trying to musically speak what the lyrics were saying as well. I love that. Like we wanted to match the lyrics and we wanted to match the heart of the song musically. And that's what, that's how Kingdom came. You know what I mean? And it was just out of us just getting together. You know, I'd start a motif. Kirk would come and say, 
let's actually do this. Or Patron would start a motif and then Kirk would say, wait, let's do this instead. And we're like, whoa, like that's, then we rehearse it all together from top to bottom. And in a moment like that, a lot of guys would get tired, they'd get exhausted and they'd tap out. But there was no space for that, bro. There was no space for us to feel like we're in a place where we want to like not rehearse. Like we're working. You get what I'm saying? And plus the reason why it was significant enough for us to rehearse is because when you go into those prisons, you can't bring your phone. So you can't chart the music. You can't bring paper. Yeah. So you have to go off of your memory off of your memory. So we had to rehearse as much as we could to get it, to get all of those songs embedded in our system. And it was super last minute. People didn't get the music until they got there. We right. were creating the music while we got there. Uh -huh. So it was just like, you're right. either gonna sink or you're gonna swim. So uh -huh. you had to choose your heart. You get what I'm saying? So, and it was just harmony, bro. So man, we did that and, and you know, with prison stuff, you got to go through paperwork. You got to go through like a lot of different mandates, bro. And man, I remember staying up and we were grinding and grinding and working so, bro, we were working hard in order for us. We couldn't even chart it. We couldn't even write it down. You know, we couldn't even play the stuff back in there you know what i'm saying they only allowed a limited amount of different things in there like it was a lot of a lot of work bro a lot of like you know early mornings and bro i didn't even sleep that night i'm gonna be honest and then we had to do the recording so when we get to we can't even wear certain things in the prison like i had to scramble through different clothes because you know, you can't wear, you know, you, you had to look apart. You can't wear blue, oh, you know, and, okay, okay. and they were gracious enough to allow me to wear blue because that's what I had on. I had a navy blue polo shirt. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And the reason why I couldn't wear blue was because the prisoners were wearing blue. Were, the, 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 uh, the prisoners were wearing blue. You yeah. get what I'm saying? So they didn't want to associate me with those guys. Yeah. Like, you can't argue against this stuff. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's just what they had policy-wise. Man, we were, man, we were up, man. We were up. Like, we recorded it. And then when we recorded it, HB came. HB came the day of the recording. And yeah. he flew straight to the prison. And this is in Miami, Florida, bro. Yeah. Oh, man. First off, when we did the prison, like, I'm going to tell you straight up, bro. Like, as we did, like, right when we got there, bro, those guys are probably the, the most kindest individuals I've ever met in my life. I'm going to be real. I had a perspective. Mm -hmm. I had a perspective. I was like, man, like, how is this going to work for us to record an album in a prison? Right. How is this going to work for us to do what we have to do in a prison? Like, is there going to be security? Is there going to be, like, our fights going to break out? You see so much on TV, and you go in and you approach mentally what you're, ex you, like, I began to create this expectation in my heart mm -hmm. for that recording out of what I see on TV. Right. And it just wasn't what it was, bro. And I was completely off. And they were some of the most kindest people, man. And you go in there, bro, and, like, I was emotional, man. I, I went in there, and when I went in there, like, I was, it was like a three-day gap. We did, we did, like, three days of recording. And then we went back again like I think a month later or something, but during that three day gap, bro, I went in there, but before I went in there, like I was like having these expectations in my heart in regards to what would it be like? What would it, what would it be like? What is this experience going to consist of? 
And I was, you know, I thought I was all by myself representing Madeline Kirk playing organ, you know, for a recording, you know, and, and doing all of this kind of stuff. Mind you, we had to write songs with them. Wow. We wrote, yeah, we did the whole nine, bro. But what, and I had a very, it was an awful, I'm gonna be honest, bro. It was a bad expectation that like, it was just going to be like this very traumatic thing. And, and I was just, I was going to experience some sort of harm and see it and all this kind of stuff, man, we were covered, bro. We were covered. And those guys are covered too. Yeah. They are very covered. And you go in there with the expectation that, you know, just because they're behind bars, that they're, they're they're around and surrounded by they're surrounded by physical harm they're surrounded by evil but I, I had to i it was at that time where i realized that heaven is not only exclusive heaven is universal Absolutely. and those guys have real encounters with god in their prison cells and it makes me think about when paul was in jail you know what I'm saying? Like, and Jesus met him, bro. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just like, yo, it's the same thing. And those guys, they sing with all their hearts, bro. And and let me tell you what was interesting about that recording. We thought about it. We were like, man. So I was just like, man, how, how, we thought about it. I was like, man, these guys are sentenced for this much amount of time. And the only brink of hope that they had were this, was just this recording. Some of these guys came to me and vulnerably said, yo, my family doesn't even visit me. Oh, they man. said that. I had a lot of guys come up and say, yo, I don't have, we don't have family that visits, that visits us. So you don't know what it means for us to be surrounded by you guys, even the presence with like the physical presence of 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 having people that are for us mm -hmm. here just yeah. meant a lot let alone the singing mm -hmm. the fact that you guys took the time i really understand like you hear people say i appreciate you taking the time to be here i actually i actually felt for the first time what it meant when those guys said we really appreciate and wholeheartedly, sincerely, like take in the fact that you guys are here with us. Right. You know what I mean? And this is where it gets tricky. And this is where my heart was broken. Like my heart got broken when, I mean, first off you look at them and you're like, man, you look at some of these guys and it's just like, bro, if y'all were given one more chance Mm -hmm. Y'all fine. Oh yeah, yeah. Y'all don't even look like y'all need to be in here. You get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. they're just that amazing. One and the way that they act was just super kind. But what was insane to me was the dichotomy that these guys spend all their time in the cell. Can you, like, I was admiring how strong they are, and this is how I admire how strong they are because they spend all their time in the cell. And some of these guys are so psychologically desperate to feel some sort of hope, to feel what it means to feel normal again, right? Wow. Yeah. And they're so psychologically desperate to understand that. And in a time where, I mean, we heard it every tour, you got the Michael Jackson of gospel bringing his whole team in Maverick City to come do a concert yeah. and to record albums. Like, can you imagine what type of breakthrough it does for them in their mind mm -hmm. and for them to go back to their cell? Oh. That's, it's, that's yeah. like, you got to be super strong for that. Right. They're, in their, they're in their cells. And they do this and like whatever, scratch what they've done. But the fact that they're locked 
in their cells. They yeah. can't go anywhere. They're locked to prison. They can't go anywhere. And then the only brink of hope they have is to them in their minds was seeing Kirk Franklin. Right. And exactly. songs with Mav, Naomi Chan, Aaron Dante, like doing all of that. And then when it's all said and done, they go back. Right. To back. Be, to that's, yeah, bro, that's that I mean. broke me, bro. Yeah. That broke me. I was like, wow. That's such a fascinating, interesting amount of like, like you don't know, like I don't know what I would have done. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine how my mind would be if the only brick of hope that I would have is a concert and then go back into being caged. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so that's like that experience, man, doing that, that stuff with them was just, it was insane, bro. It was a very heavy and emotionally moving, extremely emotionally moving, like thing for me, for me to do it. You know, like you see these guys, they look just like us. And then when you think about kingdom and you include them, it's only right, bro. You know, and you think about what heaven looks like. And some yeah. of these guys, I don't know what their psychology behind prison is. I'm speaking to prisoners. Like, I don't know what their psychology behind prisoners are, you know, behind being in prison. I don't know what that does mentally. I don't know what that does psychologically. But I can only assure that there's some sort of desperation in their minds and in their hearts that they want to be free. And even though the government is not allowing them to be free, our message to them is that they're going to be free in heaven. Right, right. So we had to display what that would feel like on earth. You get what I'm saying? As a source of hope so that they can hang on to that. That was tough, bro. That was tough. You get what I'm saying? We had to sure, yeah. help them understand what that would mean on a on a courtyard or on a on a prison yard, which is considered the most dangerous thing in the prison. Mm. It's, the, it's the prison yard. That's where all the fights break out, all yeah. the all the stuff go down there. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like, you know, and you're being surrounded. Man, it was thousands of those guys, man, like just lifting up their hands and singing old or young, I'm like, man, like, like, it's just insane. You know what I mean? So like my heart for them grew. And this is why, the reason why it meant a lot to me was because I had a heart for the prisoners. And this is an interesting thing. During college, I went through this season where I was shadowing a probation officer. Yeah. And I wanted to be a probation officer because I had and grew a heart for the prisoners. You know, I grew a heart for the criminals, man. And music just kept pulling me back into the calling. And I look years later. Yeah. And I am. It's like full it's circle. Just, it's just like, even, and to me, that meant even if like like there's so much you can unpack there bro like in regards to purpose first off like if you stay obedient mm -hmm. you know god won't he, uh, the the concept is that even if you stay obedient god won't exclude you from what you ultimately desired but he can include what you desired right. with his purpose that's so true make you happy bro you get what i'm saying and i'm just like the way that i'm pursuing my calling is a lot more effective than what i originally wanted when i when i was in college you right. get what i'm yeah. saying Definitely. the way that you know the way that it divinely orchestrated for me to be in a prison with kirk and mav doing what god called me to be is a lot different than the way that I originally wanted to be a probation officer. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And I was like, God, you, 
you really have a way of divinely orchestrating things and weaving things. And he's very strategic and he won't give you what you want the time that you want it, but he's definitely going to give you what you need. Absolutely. And maybe more he can bless you with what you actually wanted. You get what I'm saying? So it's just like, it's just, for me, it's just like, like that was the prison thing personally was more of an affirmation that I was in God's will for real. Because yeah. there's absolutely no way, bro. There's no way I would have, I would have ever thought that I would like, I wasn't thinking that when I was uh, in college that I would ever be doing this kind of stuff. You get what I'm saying? So it's yeah. not like, it's not like what I'm going through right now or what I'm doing is was premeditated no. or I prayed for it. I didn't pray for that kind of stuff. Right. God chose me to, to, and he, I don't know why, but that's just the way that he did it. You get what I'm saying? And, you know, it's just insane for me to realize, yo, at one point, you wanted your life to go this way, but you didn't. And I didn't understand why he was pulling me back into the calling of music. And then years later, bro, years later, I'm in a prison yard and I was playing. I was literally playing and looking up in the air and thinking, and Sam, years ago, you actually wanted to be a probation officer. Right. And you yeah. thought all things of, or in regards to, you know, the, you know, anything as far as penitentiary was going to be out of your way. And here is God demonstrating, man, if you walk in my will, mm. I will, I will do something that will blow your mind. Right. You know what I mean? And for me, that that was heavy for me. You get what I'm saying? It yeah. was very heavy for me, you know? But in regards to the work, bro, man, we worked hours, bro, hours, super last minute. And it's all about the creativity of it all. Like, everyone had their hand in the basket. Everyone had their hand in the pot, throwing ideas out. And even though Kirk oversaw everything, like, he's like originally we would still come up with the foundations of everything you get what i'm saying right. and he would still be kind enough to alter and you know he would make the cut and he wasn't cutting everything out like he wasn't like no this idea is horrible no nah, like like he was taking bits and pieces and modifying bits and pieces and modifying and even more so he still wasn't modifying everything but it was just a very conducive, great conducive atmosphere for us to be creative. And then the dubs for that, bro, was insane. Like, nice. like I remember having to redub a lot of different, you know, we had to redo a lot of different things, you know, and they would split the work with Kirk's team and Mab's team. And we was and we would make it all work. You get what I'm saying? But even doing everything over again it was just insane you know what i'm saying and we did we did tons of recordings and then we did another recording that um and even for some of the grammy nom stuff the stuff that was on the deluxe bro we recorded that on the bus oh wow okay okay but, wow during the tour yeah during the tour wow. it was during the tour we recorded we, we recorded that on the bus you know what I mean? We like um he, they would bring a producer out, like a homie of them out, and he would be in charge of tracking everything. And when he would track stuff, like we were called to play it. And while we were playing it, we would play it before the shows. We were tracking before and after the shows. Like wow. I re I even have recordings of me doing that. You get what I'm saying as far as deluxe, you know what I'm saying? And um even for the deluxe, there were some things that we did at a church in Charleston that made the cut on the album. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing a video for that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And that that was just Matt, Terry, I think um, Smurf from Philly on Oregon and I. Okay. That yeah. was it. And we were grump, man. I didn't have it, bro. I remember walking into that church, knowing I had a flight, 
I had a flight. The, oh, they, they gave me a flight the night before. Yeah, I remember walking into that church, and it hit me. And I was like, "Oh snap! This is where the yeah. shoot." Mm, wow. We walked into, like, we had lunch in the very space where Dylan Roof started shooting. Wow! And we saw the nine people that died. Like, mm -hmm. it hit, me, bro. And funny enough. I walked in there and I saw everything and I had a moment. And then I thought to myself, I was like, I don't have the music yet. You know what I'm saying? Oh, man. I'm like, oh snap, wow. I don't even have the music yet. So again, like we had to create on the spot. You get what I'm yeah. saying? And make it work. Yeah, they dub a lot of stuff for sure, but we still had to make it work. You get what I'm saying? So. It was tons of like, like um, a lot of like last minute, which is fine. Like I could put up with that stuff, like last minute learning and completing a lot of completions and overdubs and all of that. So, you know, and that looked a lot different from 2017, 18 with Travis. You, get oh, what I'm yeah. you know, okay. that's wow. the. That's a it's a weird journey, man. But man, it's a amazing one. It is, yeah, bro. That's what it is, you know. Yeah, just to think that you know, not too long ago, you had just started getting into music, you know, kind of cutting your teeth, learning on the spot at the church, and then here you are, like touring with, like you said, the Michael Jackson of gospel, and the biggest, and it's like it's like Michael Jackson and the Beatles together now, like <laughs> the way how Maverick City is all the time. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's incredible, man. And like, cause you see, you see a lot of people that um enjoy Maverick City's music that you know we don't really hear them typically listen to gospel. People like Diddy and stuff like that. So the impact has definitely been huge. So man, it, I, I just want to let you know, man, it's been amazing to see from afar. You know, we, like I said, I didn't know I didn't know how old you were. So it's like I'm looking up. I'm like he must be, you know, have been playing most of his life, and then to find out it hasn't been that long. It's just amazing to see, you know, the work that God is doing in your life, man. So I, I know you're encouraging me. For sure, you're encouraging other musicians, young and old. So, man, it's been a blessing, bro. And um, do you have anything, you know, that you would like to share uh, in closing with any anybody that's listening? Oh, yeah, man. I think, I think, I think the most, one of the, one of the lessons that I've learned is, like, like the Lord's been very, bro. He's been very kind, bro. For me to have as little experience like this and to be where I'm at now, and honestly, bro, I'm st I'm still not where like I want to be. To be honest with you, so it's still very humbling for me in all aspects. But to see like the fact that the Lord has some sort of like, you know, he, he got a hand in this for sure. You know, he definitely does have a hand in this, but I don't know if, I think for me, I had to redefine what a favor meant. You know, oh, yeah. I think like favor is not just being chosen to do all of these big opportunities. I think what matters the most is a lasting. It's oh. a lasting. Like, oh, yeah. what matters the most is staying there. You don't want to just have, you don't want to be just one hot shot. You know, oh, yeah. you don't want to just have one hot shot opportunity. You just don't want to, to, to just to pop one day and then to burn the next day. I think the 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 prayer is to continue to last, bro, and to and to and to um stay you know what i mean so and the reason why i say that is because the way that you last is through the daily decisions of your life bro like it's your mindset man i i encourage everybody to to continue to be developed man apply your knowledge keep learning apply being learned apply just keep learning keep growing and there's always something out there to keep to keep learning you know what i mean like and being i've learned that and being 
is not just calling out numbers. Right. You know, like I think like I think there might be a, a stereotype that church MDs are only, you know, when I sit down with industry guys, they have this like perspective that MDing in the church is a lot different than MDing in the industry. Mm -hmm. And even though I'm still learning what it means to MD in the industry, the truth of the matter is the scope, the difference is that church MDing is for the church musician, it's just calling out the music, you know, like giving head nods, you know, and, and literally giving direction, like direction that way is just different. You get what I'm saying? Yep, like yep. giving sound directions, giving music direction, giving, you know, calling out a shout, calling out different things, telling, telling the drummers what to do and telling the bass players and guitar players in the band what to do and still learning and conducting rehearsals and conducting sound checks. But in the industry, MDing is a lot different. It's a mild form of production management. It's conducting. Now, you do all of that for sure, but it's also production calls. It's right. also looking at the rider, rider yeah. having production calls and making sure that the rider is fine. It's also making sure that the stage is fine. Can you do a stage plot? Are you able to send in stage plots? And um, um, are you able to also like like have production calls and tell the people that are hosting you for your next event what you need like in regards to like different like it's the details man of advancing a show that's what that's what i'm learning and being is also being it's it's not just it's not just calling out numbers it's also being on the phone with people internationally explaining to them this is the run-up show this is how we need it to be what's a run-up show you get what i'm saying yep. letting them know, like what's the transition from this artist going to be to our artists right. and describing what that looks like hey they're going to be stage left they're going to come in it's the details you know what i'm saying yeah. and you know like what's going to take place is there going to be a video is there going to be a video while we transition you know like what's the run-up show and even having these different calls and it's a lot more leadership it's a lot it's i'm not saying it's more leadership than the church musician but it's a different way of leading like in addition to that like there's an administrative thing as well where the m MD and the and I don't know if it's all MDs, but you know, in regards to what I do, I have to make sure that everyone gets paid. What does that look like? Discussing their rates, making sure that everyone's solid with their rates, and sending the pay sheet to management. It's a lot, bro. You know what I mean? It's a lot of like administration and a lot of different, like um, a lot of different, even hard conversations, like making sure that everyone feels comfortable with their rates. And if not, then what are we gonna, what steps are we gonna take from here on out? Like, right. it's, you know, it's like, and in addition to it, I don't know about everyone else, but playback isn't just running stems. It's also sending time code to front of house to make sure that they have lights. It's also putting it's also putting the video content into Ableton and making sure that the line, like to making sure that the video content lines up with the stems and making, it's also finding out the dimensions of the walls and making sure that the graphic videos and the video content is resized to fit and scale the dimensions of the walls that everyone else has. That's MD. Mm -hmm. It's making like I have to do playback and some people do have their own playback engineers, but right now, and some people are, aren't just in the position where they can do that. You right. get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And, and, and being responsible for a whole nother body, which means flights and hotels and food, 
you know what I'm saying? Everyone has their own different shit. You know what I mean? So a lot of times it's 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 a lot of like it's a lot of like um just behind the scenes stuff. It's almost it's a very small, mild form of production management. For an example, some of the artists they don't get to sound check. If it's safe, for instance, their flights get canceled. Mm -hmm. Like if, if or delayed, my bad, not canceled. But if Chandler's flight got delayed and he was only able to get there right when the show started, I have to check his ears. Wow. Are you able to sonically represent what he would want? Oh, yeah. At the time where he's not there, wow. that's the responsibility of an MD. You get what I'm saying? Yes, and for him to feel comfortable, this you know. You know, or if he does come and he doesn't have time because they're asking for him to do press, they're asking for him to do interviews. I still have to go to sound check and take care of him and make sure that his piano is in the right spot, make okay. sure that his guitar has a pack, and I have to make sure that his ears are fine and the wedges are fine. That's the responsibility of an MD. And in addition to make sure that the playback is running, time code's running, the video content is running. People know the music. The production knows the transitions. It's a lot, bro. It's a lot. You know what I mean? It's a very significant thing. Now, some people don't have to do that, and they're in the industry. And all they have to do, like, they have people for that. You know what I mean? But I'm sure every MD is aware of the writer. I'm yeah. sure every MD is aware of they're included in production calls. You get what I'm saying? So yeah. like, and they, and they're, they, they have some sort of awareness into, in regards to what they need, you know, to advance the show. And they work with production managers. You know what I mean? It's just a big responsibility. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's just, that's the truth of it, man. It's just also learning. I would also encourage everybody to, I think the misconception that I see guys have is that I, it's gonna hear me out. I, it might be a little harsh, but the truth of the matter is this: the misconception that a lot of guys have is that they 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 think that it is right to get ready when they have the opportunity. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I agree with that. I think it's a lot better for you to treat your local church as if you're playing for Kirk Franklin. Absolutely, yeah. Matter of fact, that's actually how I scope out subs. Mm -hmm. if, 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 if the person that I'm scoping out and scouting treats their local church with the same intentionality that they would treat the the big tour mm -hmm. to me they're qualified because that's faithfulness. Faithfulness says I will play in a room of 10 people as if it was a room of 10,000. Yeah, yeah. And my intentionality does not change. And if my intentionality does change, then there's a problem that we need to address. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think I think the truth of the matter is we I encourage everybody, man, like like I don't know if touring is everyone's end all be all, truth be told, but if it is, I always encourage guys, man, treat your local church as if you are touring. Everything that you would do for the local church, I mean, I'm sorry, everything that you would do for touring apply at your church man apply at your church and and trans it's it's really calling guys to transformation it's really calling guys to to be inspired that you don't have to wait for the gig in order to all of a sudden unleash your beast unleash your beast at home bro mm -hmm. like do the whole light thing at home, do the whole Ableton thing at home. Learn what it means to 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 have like start dreaming for your local church. You get what I'm saying? Start dreaming 
for your home. It's your backyard. Start dreaming for your foundation. You know, eat, do the most with what you have and master what it means to do the most with less. When you master what it means to do the most with less, that's when you translate those skills. And once you get there, people are like, man, how did you, how did you, how are you able to apply what you, what you're doing on a tour as opposed to what you're doing back home? Well, the reason is because this stuff, you've been, you've actually been manifesting it back home. You get what I'm saying? It's because you've done it back home. You've manifested it back home. That's why you don't wait until you get the opportunity. And then you're like, man, I got a lot of catching up to do. So you're starting to scramble right. the night before trying to get things done. No, no, no. You knock all of that. And the, your church is the tour. For real. Your mm -hmm. church is the thing that you want to see happen you get what i'm saying your church like you inspire like you're supposed to be inspired and, and motivated to do to do the thing that you would in 10 out in front of ten thousand people to do it in front of 10 people at your home church you get what i'm saying and that's faithfulness faithfulness is not just it's not just faithfulness to me is not just being prepared all the time my bad but being prepared all the time. Faithfulness is not just being prepared all the time. Faithfulness also looks like intentionality. Would you play the same way in front of 10,000 as you would 10 people? <clears throat> you know what I mean? Like, would you play in front of 10 people with the same intentionality and heart? It's a question of the heart, bro. That's faithfulness. And that's how I scope out the subs you know what i mean like yeah they decide to they're playing and they're just naturally hungry and their hunger is based out of their hunger comes with no condition right if your hunger comes with no condition man the world is yours you're unstoppable you're the ultimate currency is not whether or not you'd be able to 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 be super skillful in front of 10,000. That's not what moves these artists anymore. Yeah. I'm telling you that right now. What moves these artists is are you the same in front of 10 people as as you are in front of 10,000 people? Are you the same socially with your friends as you would with artists in a green room? Mm -hmm. For real. And yeah. if you can unlock and maintain that same consistency then you won wow. if you can yeah if you can if you're if what moves you if 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 you're not being able to be moved or be swayed by ten thousand people then you're automatically you're automatically gonna win because your heart is consistent and it stays the same and that's what god needs bro he needs a heart that is consistent. He needs a heart that says, I don't care, no matter what it is, there's nothing that can satisfy my soul more than Jesus. Yes. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much people's out there. Jesus, you're still the main thing. And there's still an audience of one. And that's the truth, bro. And that's the truth. So I encourage everyone, you know, man, just to be faithful and faithfulness doesn't always mean you know staying at a place for a long time faithfulness is intentionality are you able to perform and and to project the same heart and intentionality and and heart posture in front of 10 people as you would 10,000 people that's the true mark of faithfulness that's the true mark of loyalty and God chooses a heart like that rather than someone who just is killing all the time. You get what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Because to be real, everybody can play, bro. Everybody can play, you know? But if I tell, but if I tell a guy right now that I need him to sub at a church that is at uh, that uh, if I need if I need him to set up at a church that only fits 150 people, right? Yeah. And and then 
he and then he says uh and he's making his way to kind of hold it off and he's acting fishy and being like nah i can't do it yeah and then i test him again and i say yo matter of fact instead of 100 150 people i need you to sub for me with kirk franklin and maverick city at this show and he all of a sudden makes room for it oh, yeah. that's exposure you get what i'm saying yeah. that's exposure and i don't know if i can trust someone with a heart like that you get what i'm saying so yeah. i like the truth of the matter is, man, you don't, first off, you don't have to get there to get ready. You get, you stay ready, yes, you sir. get developed, you learn Ableton, you learn what you need to do, you learn how to do all this stuff. You get what I'm saying? Everything that I've done, I didn't start scrambling when I got there. I swear to you, I did not. Mm -hmm. I did not accumulate all these things as soon as, soon as I got there. Yes, I got better with experience, but there was always this, this behind the scenes grind that I've always done in order for me to show myself approved. You get what I'm saying? Yes. And that's what the word says, man. If you you gotta study to show yourself approved. You yes, get sir. what I'm saying? Because what ends up happening is you get tried. And if you can get tried, and in addition to you getting tried, if you can last and show that you've actually studied. And, and the reason why that's important is you're only going to manifest publicly what you've been growing privately. That's good. That's good. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. You're always going to, you're, it's truth in, truth out. Garbage in, garbage out. Whatever, you, whatever you're able to, to show publicly, whatever you're able to demonstrate and to display publicly is always going to be a manifestation of what you what you've grown and what you've been doing behind the scenes privately that's the truth you get what i'm saying so i'm encouraging y'all to grow privately that way there's a grace there's an advancement and there's an expedited grace and advancement for the public eye that way the public eye can be like wow this guy you can tell that he spends time with God because he manifests his public, his private prayers on his, you know, and it, in his alone time with God. You get what I'm saying? So sure. that's the truth, man. I always encourage people. You're you're always going to be, uh, you're always going to be a a a public display of what you go privately, man. So what do you do in your private time? You work hard, you grind, you study, you get inspired, you learn Ableton. If you can, if you don't have anything to practice, practice Ableton. Yeah. You know, I used to do that. I used to literally run the show in my two little speakers, bro, as if it was a show and and literally do it with Ableton. That, that way when I get to the show, I can just plug in and play and I don't have I don't have anything to worry about. I promise you. That's you hear what I'm saying? So always find a way, man. There's always something out there for you to learn. Learn if you don't have anything to practice, which I'm sure there is, because yeah. music is endless. You get what I'm saying? So just practice Ableton, man. Practice what it means to run a show. Practice what it means to 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 start creating, man. Start dreaming. Like like, I don't know what's going on, but like, I just personally feel like, like, you know, I, for me, there's just been this different desire to not only be different, but to also, to also be fresh, to be birthed. I want to be birthed with new ideas, yeah. create arrangements, bro. There's ways you can strip the music and get it acapella and plug it into Ableton and just start going crazy. Yeah, and yeah. just creating arrangements. Be creative. You gotta, you gotta practice and manifest your creative juices, you know. And the only way to you don't develop that on the spot. You you practice, man. You know what I'm saying? Because whatever you consume privately, you know, whether it was music or anything else, whatever you consume and whatever your taste buds are attracted to privately is what you're gonna play publicly, bro. So always try 
to I always encourage guys, man, just get creative. And creativity can look like a lot of different things. You know, creativity can look like, like, you know, whether it was playing or whether it is arranging or producing or flipping a whole different song. Like, you know what I'm saying? The world is yours. You get you get what I'm saying? The world is yours. There's so much you can do. And my main point is you don't have to wait till you get a cur a Kurt gig to feel like you have to all of a sudden start manifesting it. That's just not how it works. It doesn't work that way. You get what I'm saying? So sure. I always encourage everyone, man, just, just, just go for it, man. Learn, work on being developed, stay integral. And that's probably the number one thing. The reason why integrity is significant is because even on a supernatural standpoint, your decisions, what you do, always sows into your spiritual destiny, right? Yes, you sir. look at you look at your decisions, like every decision that you've made, it's almost like your decisions are as equivalent to you planting, right? And you putting seeds in the ground you putting seeds in the ground are literally that's a that's a visual representation of making decisions right and your destiny is what comes out from the seed of the ground wow. so every decision that you've ever made it, it it's literally sowing whether it was you know, with women, whether it was with drugs, whether it was with anything else, you're literally, you're literally sowing into your spiritual destiny, even spiritually. And I've always had a fear for that. I've always had a healthy sense of fear for my spiritual destiny. I've always wanted to make sure that whatever I was doing, man, like what if even if it was with a girl, like I know that I'm 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 going to feel the fruit of it some way, mm -hmm. somehow, like some way, somehow. And the reason why integrity is very significant is because integrity rides under the umbrella in the wings of your destiny, right? And a lot of times integrity can be a question, man, and it's a very unfortunate thing. But if you remain integral, not only will you be covered, but you'll have a lot more years of advancement because of your integrity. And the truth of the matter is, the reason why integrity is so significant is because God needs that. He, yes. needs, he needs someone that says, I will do the right thing even when no one's watching. He needs someone that's cut from that type of cloth. He needs someone that says, man, I will do, I will keep you at the forefront of my heart, God. My ultimate currency is not pleasure. My ultimate currency is righteousness. Mm -hmm. You know, it's righteousness. It's staying faithful. If I have a girlfriend, it's staying faithful to my girl, man and not entertaining anything. And the reason why that's so significant is because in the book of Solomon, it speaks about that. It says, it speaks about how significant it is to stay faithful to um, yourself and God. It says, it speaks about how, uh, it says that uh, uh, men do not submit your strength to women mm. the reason being is because what ends up happening is it is the very thing that kills kings wow bro it's in the word mm -hmm. it's in the word bro sir like it's in the word like you can't argue against this stuff it's in the word you know what i mean yep. and in a moment and and that's just not and that's just for that's just the principle of the kingdom man if you stay right God's gonna cover you, man. If you if if you eradicate every bone of question, if you eradicate every, any bone 
of uh, of filth of things that don't make sense of of temptation and you stay faithful bro man and you're working on being developed bro there's absolutely nothing that the lord can't do for you you know what i mean and the and the truth of the matter is with integrity man artists respect that artists respect people that are integral apart from god like even naturally like if you just stay faithful and you stay the course and you're responsible and you respect and you honor people and you're not a person that creates subcultures talking behind people's back or you're not a person that has a, a vibe and be, they can tell bro they can feel that kind of stuff for real a matter of fact they'll be able to point that out earlier than you'll 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 you're able to even fester or create it. You know what I mean? So like if you're a person that just is just toxic and and you're just you're just not you're just not safe to even be around, even on an emotional well-being standpoint, or even even on a standpoint of society, a standpoint of your social surroundings, bro. It's, it's going to be hard, man. It's going to be hard. But if you stay integral, you do the right thing. You work hard. You apply your knowledge. I'm not saying it's going to come easy, but I believe, man, like, and the indication of blessing, the indication of advancement is a battle. You know what I mean? Like the indication of, the indication of advancement is warfare. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you why that's significant, because the devil wants nothing more than to keep you from where you are. You get what I'm saying? He yeah. wants to keep you in a place where you're stagnant and you're and you're going through this thing called spiritual atrophy where you're paralyzed. He wants to keep you paralyzed. You know why? Because even the devil knows how far you can get. You get what I'm saying? So he'll do everything in his best ability to make sure that he gets you to change your perspective, a lot of different things. And it's, and out of your perspective, you begin to act, you begin to perform as a human being out of perspective in any way that you want to. And if you act out of bad integrity, then you know what I'm saying? He won you, you get what I'm saying? So. I think the most significant thing is, man, just stay integral, stay real, be honest with people, man. Word gets around, especially in the industry, you know, be honest with people, be real, be respectable, be honoring, you know, and at the same time, be confident. You know, I don't think I'm, humility means being insecure. No. Humility, humility means being confident, but in a godly way, you know, it's okay to, to think that you're a great man, Andrew. It's okay to think that it's God wants you to believe that you are a great person. You know what I'm saying? That you are great. You accomplish a lot, but you don't allow that to be your absolute, yeah, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. don't allow that to be your main thing, but it's okay to look at yourself and pat yourself on the on the shoulder and tell yourself, man, I did a great job today because of how I handled my wife and my family, yeah. and not how I handled these circumstances. And 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 the glory definitely does go to God. You get what I'm saying? So there's this there's this dualism there where you don't you don't look at yourself inadequate because you're a son and you know who your father is, bro. And that's for everybody. We're all sons. We know who our father is, and it's God. And he calls us by name. Yeah. And it's okay, man. You get what I'm saying? And it's not to say that you're not going to have any issues. Issues are unbearable. Issues are universal. They're going to come and go. But if you know your place as a son, and you don't allow the enemy to dictate who you are, man, man, there's, there's nothing that the Lord can't do through you, man. And that's the thing. So I encourage everybody to get good at being them. Learn your identity, you know, and the devil tries in any way to get people to get trained through fear school. 
He tries to cloud people through who they are. And you look up and you're like, man, I don't even, I'm trying to sound like other people. Nah, man, don't, don't fall into that kind of stuff, man. You know what your taste buds are. You know what you're attracted to. You know what you like. Maintain yourself, stay the course, and continue. You know what I mean? Yes, sir, bro. The wisdom that you're that. sharing. Okay. No, no, no. The wisdom that you're sharing is so incredible. Like I, I'm just, I'm soaking it all in. It, it's a blessing to me, and I know those that are listening are just being poured into the same way I am. So I got to tell you, bro. Thank you, man. You, you definitely have, like I said, a heart of gold, man, and the willingness to share. Because, like I said, you, you're, you're on a level that you know many everybody's looking up to because like Maverick City is doing something that we haven't seen before in the Christian space. God mm -hmm. has accelerated your growth. And, yeah. you know, it's great to hear how much that you put in the time studying and, you know, studies to show yourself approved. And, you know, it's not just God doing it, but you working alongside and doing your part. So, man, it's, it's been so encouraging. I, I truly enjoyed this interview and I thank you so much for your time, bro. Bro, anytime, man, anytime, man. Hit me anytime. I know I may not respond as fast, bro, but man, I'm I'm there for sure. You get what I'm saying? And it's, it's been such an abnormal season, man. But man, anybody, if anybody needs anything, man, I am willing, bro, super willing to help anyone out with anything for real. And I actually mean that for real. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. yeah. Thank you, man. Keep yes, going, sir. keep grinding. What you're doing is incredible, man. Because you you've been able to get access to and what you've done is you've been able to get access to a lot of people like people's role models. Right. They've never heard some of these guys speak, and and in a sense through those interviews, it gives it gives your audience what it feels like to sit under them, to know them, to hear them, and to understand what they don't post to understand the stories that people don't have access to hearing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's creating a different level of transparency. Sure. You know what I'm saying? A different level of vulnerability. That's what it does with those interviews, man. And I enjoy that, man. I love hearing other people that I've looked up to, to speak. You know what I'm saying? And it's, it's, it's incredible and to not be a part of that. It's just like, man, thank you. You know what I'm saying? So keep going, bro. You know, you're a legend. What you're doing is incredible. It, just keep keep the course. Keep going, man. Don't stop no matter what. I'm always behind you, bro. Always. Man, I really appreciate that encouragement, man. Thank you so much once again for pouring, for being a part of this, man. It's a true honor. And to those listening, thank you for tuning into this uh, interview, this podcast episode. As I always say, only what you do for Christ will last. Take it one day at a time and keep it pushing. This has been another episode of The Interlude with Drew. God bless you guys. Until next time. Yep. It's The Interview with Drew. Welcome to The Interlude with Drew.